I'm Sarah Canada. And I'm Cheryl Bernard. And this is the new and improved Ms. to Kids version of Talking Points. And if you like the old version, you're really so going to love Sarah's this life. version. Yes, you are. This way better than you guys do. Yeah, right. God, what are you? Wait, wait a move, minute. Move, move, no, move. No, no, no. I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And Actually, we're here to promote the upcoming Be There Sabbath School Workshop. That's right. It's going to be held right here at the Michigan Conference office on Sunday, May 5, from 10 a.m., to 4 p.m. And lunch will be provided. There's going to be training for all levels of Sabbath school work, so register today at michigansspm.org or at mistakids.org. So, be, be there. there. I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We're rolling now right into our continuation of our Great Controversy study guide, uh, all about the, man, I'd, <laughs> how do you describe the Great Controversy in one quick all sentence? All about the Great Controversy. Well, well. yes, but the, the Great Controversy, of course, started in heaven, but this is specifically looking at from the early Christian church to our day today, and even looking right. into the future, what Bible prophecy says, how these this grand battle between Christ and Satan manifests here on the earth and is going to be fulfilled I hope soon and very soon. So, well, the th the the interesting thing then is with the Sabbath school lesson we made this point uh, last week as we introduced it. It's not a study of the book The Great Controversy, but mm -hmm. with a lot of uh, Ellen White's books for example will be comments on 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 the Bible when you have this era of great controversy, you basically have the book of Acts mm -hmm. and the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get a little bit with the book of Hebrews into the some of mm -hmm. what but in the in the Christian Church, you, of course, all the councils of the New Testament. But basically, are, it's a New Testament commentary. But it it, yeah. it, it goes way beyond yes. the canon of Scripture. Yes. So what do you do with that in a Bible <laughs> study? Well, those principles of Scripture. One of the things I really like about it is the principles of Scripture. Um, a lot of people today say, "Well, how do I apply those things from two thousand years ago?" This is a perfect example as mm. we're drawing out those principles and applying them over the years and with a context that. Uh, applies or with uh, an application that applies especially to our context today. Absolutely. And in fact, that's what we're going to be looking at. My little introduction statement here says, this week's lesson draws practical insights from the experience of faithful believers in the earliest years of the Christian church. So oh, I should have just read that. There you go. But <laughs> the title of this week's lesson is called The Central Issue, Love or Selfishness. <laughs> But, and I obviously it touches on those themes, but if you were to break it down simply and chronologically, it's from the fall of Jerusalem and the early centuries of the Christian church. What were the experience of believers there? And of course, what are the lessons we can take away? So I actually put this week's talking points together. So if you would start us off with a word of prayer, I'll walk through the lesson. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the privilege we have of studying your word together. We are thankful for the spirit of truth to give us an understanding in your truth. I do pray, Lord, that you would guide this Talking Points uh, uh, episode as well as our teachers that are going to be um, watching this and preparing for their classes. And Lord, for our people worldwide as they study these subjects, that your spirit would lead us to a way to implement these principles of your word into our daily lives, for we ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, <clears throat> as I had mentioned this week's study, though titled central issue, love, or selfishness, really break, boils down to a chronological study of the experience of the believers when Jesus, at the very end of Jesus' ministry, as he departs, Jerusalem falls, and the Christian right. church basically is inaugurated and is launched into the world. What was it like then, and what lessons can we learn from our day to day? Maybe we should interject here, because you were saying that the way that, that this lesson is, is put together and what it covers it'd be easy to come up with probably 10 different sets of three talking points. Not a problem at all. In fact... So you don't have to use, we say this all the time, you don't have to use our talking points. Yes. There's a lot of, you may pull other points, but there's a lot of material here. Well, for example, if you, we'll come back to our talking points in a second, but if you just took the chronology and said, let's look at that uh, fall of Jerusalem experience. What did yeah. Jesus say about it? What warned his people? There's a study right there that would That's be an right. entire Sabbath school class. No problem. Mm -hmm. Then you could go into what about the early believers who went through that and then were persecuted afterwards? 
Well, there's a whole study on there. And how did the gospel spread? Through the book of Acts. There's a study there. And it's all in this week's lesson. So you could go 100, and each of those would be a really good Sabbath school class. Yeah. So anyway, what I've drawn out, again, number one, God never forsakes his people. Uh, that coming for primarily from Sunday and Monday's lesson. Great. Num talking about number two, Satan's most effective weapon isn't persecution. Though I'm sure that's what Christians fear a lot. Or, or, mm -hmm. or, or The thing is, it's really not his best weapon. He uses it, but it doesn't really work. So that's Monday, Tuesday, and Fridays where that's coming from. It seems to us like it would really work. And it seems, obviously to him, at one point it seemed like it would really work. But then when it actually... Yeah. unfolded, it, it, it wasn't as effective as, and that's what we're going to And we're going to see evidence of that in the early Christian experience. And finally, talking about number three, Bible truth is demonstrated in personal ministry. So that's coming right. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. <clears throat> so let's go back to this, God never forsakes his people. Now, when we say his people, you know, obviously all people are God's people. He were all created in his image, mm -hmm. but he had a special people denominated, you know, in the, in the ancient world, Israel, right? He raised up Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that lineage, to be his representatives in this world. He had a special concern for them, but it was not unconditional. It was not just, well, you guys do whatever you want and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll bless you no matter what. He laid out in their ancient past the, the rules of the relationship, if you will, like, if you're faithful and obedient, you will be blessed and you will be a light to the whole world. On the other hand, there will be consequences for your disobedience that will be seen in the history of your people if you don't remain faithful to me. So I put in the notes that the prosperity of God's people is conditioned upon obedience. He does not just say, well, I guess I've picked Israel and no matter what they do, everything's going to be fine. No, they had to partake in that covenant relationship themselves. Right. And as you study the history of Israel, Time and again, you will see that they chose to depart from that path of faithfulness and as a result, experience the consequences. So for instance, I just jotted down a few key ones in, 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 the, in the notes there. You think of the, Lord, give us a king such as all the other nations have. And he said, well, I'm your king. They said, no, no, but we want one. And he says, it's not going to go well, but they right. do it anyway. Well, then the history of a divided uh, Israel is, is, is the record of that disobedience. Afterwards, you had the fall, uh, the, the besiegement in Babylon, you know, the, the captivity mm -hmm. in Babylon. And now when we get to the, to where the meat of this lesson, we have Jesus in the, in the uh, early century, the first century. And what's Israel doing? They're being uh, persecuted or at least subjugated by the Roman Empire. Right. So they never lived up to that potential that faithfulness would have resulted in. And the last thing that God does for his denominated people of ancient Israel was to send his own son. He sent messengers mm -hmm. and he sent prophets and he gave all kinds of, he even used Babylon as a, he's called my servant Nebuchadnezzar, that'll help. But they don't, they don't take the lesson well. And that's outlined in Luke's parable in, in chapter yes. 20. Yeah. And briefly, you know that parable, of course, that Jesus talks about how there's a, there's an owner and he sends mm -hmm. his servants to the disobedient servants, you know, a messenger to the disobedient, right. and they keep beating them. And then them. messengers and messengers. Yeah. And I'll he, send my son, surely they'll receive my son. Exactly. And they kill him and say, oh, this is the one. If we kill him, then <laughs> right, we're in the... We it. It's just ridiculous. And so through this history, perhaps it's most clearly in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, where the prophecy is given mm. that you have 70 prophetic weeks, 490 years, to, and, and he outlines all the reforms that could take place. And when Messiah comes, you could receive him and accept him and the world would be lightened with his glory. Right. But we know that that's not what happened. Uh, you were looking in the Gospel of John, I think. In well, you actually had 10, 11, and I'm not sure the point. I, I, I see you have it in your notes, but it came to my mind, and maybe it's the ahead. same point you were going to make. But 10 and 11 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. That's what I was looking for. But I was thinking of verse 12 in light of what you were saying, because it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Yes. So we always talk about, well, we're all children of God. But it's interesting, the scripture says, you know, he gave the right uh, to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Yes. And so there is a distinction there that while God created us all, 
to become sons of God, technically we have to be born of God yes. or born again. So there is that. So. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting that John, looking back, of course, is written after yes. Jesus' death and, and you know betrayal by his own people, could write, he came to his own, but his own did not mm-hmm. receive him. But for those who would receive him. You know, so it's not like... Including a, Jew and Gentile. Exactly. So it's not like writ large, I'm done with people or those people. God... God, and my top point is this, God never forsakes his people, and his people are those who will remain faithful to him. And so yes. he's got this covenant with the nation of Israel, but even though the whole nation might reject him, those individuals within that structure, or even outside of that, anyone who would be partner with him in mm-hmm. the covenant of mercy and grace, he's going to take as his own Amen. and protect them. And that's exactly what we see. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Uh, this is going to be a key passage for this week's study. And here Jesus is standing. Why don't you read verses 37 through 39 of Matthew 23. Matthew 23, 37 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, You shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm. And you can just hear the 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 pathos in his voice that Mm -hmm. he's he's longing for them. Because he is Jesus Christ is the final message of warning by God to his own people. I will send my son. Surely they will not reject him. And early on in Jesus' ministry, he tried to clean out the temple, right? He said, My father's Mm -hmm. house will be a house of prayer. But now in these final hours of his life, the closing days of his ministry. He stands over the hill of Jerusalem and even in the temple courts, and he essentially weeps over her. In fact, literally does so. Mm-hmm. What could have been, but you rejected it. And now he says, your house is left to you desolate. He's, it's just a transition point in the history of the Christian, what, Christian the, of the faithful throughout all the time, that God had this people and they have rejected him. And he, he's not saying, God's not breaking his covenant. Right. They've broken their end. And he Absolutely. said, I wish it were different, but you've chosen this, and now I'm going to walk away. And it's, it's really disheartening. I mean, it's really, it should be uh, a cause for lamentation and reflection. But even with that, it, it's interesting. He says, your house, he's talking about the temple. Matthew 24, of course, logically comes immediately next. It says, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. So you can imagine Jesus says, your house is desolate. And he walks away and his disciples are like, uh, did you see where we were? Mm-hmm. He, he, look at it again. Can you see right. it? It's beautiful. And Jesus makes this prediction. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he, and he foretells, which would, would happen in, you know, a good, you know, just a few couple centuries later, three centuries or so later, this destruction of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Four, I guess. And he's like, look, this is going to all fall down. The spiritual vibrancy was me, and that's rejected, and I'm leaving. Well, what's interesting with the whole thing is, and you're alluding to it, but at this point there was no outward, I mean, Obviously, there was the outward behavior of the religious leaders, but people weren't picking up on that. The temple was still intact. This speaks volumes to the idea of institutionalism. Mm. It's like, you know, look at our temple. It's beautiful, and it's so ornate, and surely God is with us. And we could do the same thing today. Well, we have hospitals, we have this, we have that. Mm -hmm. And praise the Lord, but... That in and of itself is not an evidence of the favor, divine favor Absolutely of God. True. And this is what we're seeing here. And the disciples are like, well, look at the temple. You might want to rethink what you're saying. And he said, no, you need to look at the spirituality. That's so true. That's so true. Well, in this case, Jesus is looking at those physical buildings and he's drawing yes. their attention. He's like, don't put your faith in the temple. You got to put your faith in God, the God who built the temple. And he can rescue this. Mm-hmm. Now, what I think is fascinating about this, they're literally plotting Jesus' death at this point, right. and it's going to be fulfilled in a week's time. He's going to be gone. Uh, f- f- I mean, f- dead from their perspective, yes. right? And you would think that if there was any people who would, God could say, well, they got what's coming to them. Just leave them be. Mm-hmm. But even in that moment where Jesus knows what's coming, he offers a way out for anyone who would believe. Because if you go down mm-hmm. to verses 15 and onward, Why don't you read verses um, 
verses 15 to 22. Just read those real quick. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on his housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. So he foretells this calamitous experience that's going to befall Mm -hmm. Jerusalem and all the the Jews, right, Mm -hmm. at that time. And he says, but there's a sign given that you can escape what I've just described. And he calls it again, verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, now, interesting, it was the same Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 that yes. foretold the time of your visitation. Like, this is when you mm-hmm. have to get ready. And at the end of that, Messiah is going to come. But there would be this abomination in that same chapter 9 spoken That's of. And right. Jesus referred them to that. He's like, we've had that 490 years, right? Or we're in that time of probation now. But that desolation is going to come. Watch for it. And when you see that sign, get out. Mm-hmm. And you will be safe. And he says, flee, don't run, to, don't go back home, don't pick up anything, don't go, just get out when you see the sign. And amazingly, I mean, amazingly from a human spec- perspective, but predictably from a Bible believing Christian's perspective, Christ's word came exactly true. Mm-hmm. The lesson has a description of this. Well, before you get into that, yeah. it's even, even, it's funny when you look at Daniel 9, we look at the 2300 day prophecy. We always conclude at the end of the 2300 days, 34 AD, when you mean, Stephen is stoned. And you're talking about the, 90, the, the, the seven, 70 weeks prophecy. Yes, the 70 week end. That, yeah. well, I, exactly. In, in the course of the 70 week prophecy. Yes, the, 90, the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9. Yeah. Um, you know, we look at the, the stoning of Stephen in 34. 34 AD, but the 70 week prophecy extends to the destruction of Jerusalem, as you said. He points out that mm. destruction even be. And in his mercy, like, God could have brought the destruction of Jerusalem in 34 A.D., 38 A.D., 41 A.D. Waits till 70 A.D. Mm -hmm. to give his people opportunity, as you're you're, you're highlighting. And that's exactly the point. Because you see Stephen in Acts chapter 7 saying, was was there a prophet your fathers didn't persecute, and now you've killed the coming? He lays the axe to the root, right? This is the problem. They killed him. The 70 weeks Mm -hmm. are summed up. But even in 34 A.D., it doesn't fall. It's right. got several decades left for for the for the truth to spread, for the knowledge to be... A, and so everyone had an opportunity to get out, is the whole point. Uh, on Monday, paragraph 1 and 2, why don't you read the first one, and I'll read the second one there. God's mercy, grace, providence, and foreknowledge are clearly revealed in the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Cestus uh, Gallus and the Roman armies surrounded the city. In an unexpected move, when their attack seemed imminent, they withdrew. The Jewish armies pursued them and won a great victory. With the Romans fleeing and the Jews pursuing, the Christians in Jerusalem fled to Pella and Perea beyond the Jordan River. And then quoting from Great Controversy, page 30, the promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians, and now an opportunity was offered for all who would to obey the Savior's warning. Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Mm. So the Roman army comes in, sets up the the sign, they flee, the Jews pursue, and now there's this vacuum. And the Christians are like, this is our moment, let's go. Yeah, despite the impossibility of the situation, God gave them an out that was safeguarded. Which, I mean, if God could do that for them physically, what can he do for us spiritually in Mm. our time of need, right? If he's always providing a way out. But anyway, we got to move on to talk point number two, that Satan's most effective weapon isn't persecution. You can say, oh, the Lord saved them then, so that means that all Christians are going to be safe from persecution. No, persecution, hardship, Mm -hmm. oppression, whatever you want to call it, is going to be the expected plight of the Christian. It's the, it's the, um, I feel that we're living in a bit of an odd time where we're not facing Mm -hmm. persecution as Christians to the extent that other generations have, right? And I know we're looking at Bible prophecy, it's going to come again. But repeatedly, Jesus tells his followers, expect persecution. It's coming, right? And so Christians shouldn't be surprised by or Mm. shaken by persecution. In fact, as we're going to see here, the evidence is that actually the Christian church is 
built on persecution. It actually thrives on persecution. It feeds on it. And it's an odd, you were mentioning it, it's right. almost counterintuitive. Well, wouldn't you want to stomp it? Yeah, but as yeah. soon as you do, it squishes out and it, it mm. just spreads more. And so Satan, for all the terror that he might try to inflict in people and still in their minds of all the persecution and oppression, it doesn't actually stop the Christian church from moving forward or hinder the faith of the Christian individual. It's really an ineffective weapon. Mm. So, I um, had mentioned how in Matthew 10, Jesus told his disciples that they were going to be persecuted. Second Timothy 3, Paul tells Timothy, all who live godly will face persecution. And that's exactly what Jesus prophesied in Matthew chapter 24, that to the very end of time, uh, they will be hated, they will be persecuted, but those who endure to the end will be saved. So, why don't you read that first paragraph from Tuesday's quarterly there? Sure, Tuesday's quarterly. Which I think, by, before you read it, Note in this one paragraph, they're going to cover the history of the church, Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 8, 7, 12, 9. I mean, basically, the whole Christian early church persecution is summed up in one paragraph. And this is actually the second paragraph on Tuesday. It says, okay. the disciples face threats, imprisonment, persecution, and death itself, yet in the power of the Holy Spirit, courageously proclaim the resurrected Christ, and churches multiplied through Judea, Galilee and Samaria. Which is exactly as Christ had foretold it. When he left, he said, you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as Acts unfolds, sure enough, that's what happens. And it's not because God protected them from persecution. They actually thrived on the persecution. It was, as we're going to see in our final talking point, it actually provided an opportunity for expanding their ministry. Well, I, I mean, I'm looking at our clock, but that's what I'm thinking. There's a, a lot of persecution is psychological, to mm. be honest. I mean, there are a lot of Christians. That, in fact, this whole secret rapture theory is, it, it, despite its lack of biblical evidence, is received by the masses because it's an escape from persecution. Mm. And, and yet, when we're looking at the Bible, the reason that the Lord, I mean, Seventh-day Adventist know, Ellen White says when, pro, when probation closes, None of God's people will ever be persecuted, put to death mm -hmm. anymore because there's no more purpose for it. Mm -hmm. In other words, the only reason God has ever allowed persecution is because persecution is when the light shines. It shines through the darkness. I mean, oh, so we're nice when everybody else is nice and everything is going easy. That doesn't say anything. It's when the Christian, it, it's in the pressure of persecution that Christianity is revealed. Absolutely really. true. And so... When you have the mind, and when you realize that the apostles understood that, and so they, instead of fearing it, they could look forward like, this is another opportunity. Yeah, they would literally really, glory in it. Because like they yes. know, ultimately, <laughs> even if I die here, we're winning this thing. Yes. And it changed their perspective, and it gave them that boldness, and uh, so they could face that persecution much differently. And you look at the Christian church today, what does it say of the Christian church? Mm. We're just like, hey, if I can just escape this for me. Mercy. It just... A, Vast difference. Well, that ties into that selfishness, love or selfishness central yes. issue. It, it, it's evidence when the persecution comes, are you truly God's people? Now, listen to this from Great Controversy, page 41. You'll find it in Monday's lesson, and too. Yeah, and Tertullian right after. It says, in vain were Satan's oh, efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. I love that. In vain were his efforts to destroy the church by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat they conquered. God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. And you mentioned Tertullian's testimony. Uh, yeah, then she testimony. quotes from Tertullian yeah. in his apology where he says, You may kill us, torture us, condemn us. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. Amen. And w what an inspiring way. If, if that were the end of the Sabbath school lesson, like, now let's get out mm. there and regardless of what happens, we're going to keep pushing on. But... There's one other point that came out, and, and the lesson spent a couple of days worth of focus on this, and I think it's a good point, that what about Christianity was so appealing? Was it just the fact that they were biblically right? Well, yes, but I would say that the, the Jewish people had the oracles of God, right? But there was something that was different about Christians. that They didn't just have the truth about uh, doctrinal things, but they... They had Jesus, of course, they accepted him, but not only did they accept him in theory, they accepted the person of Jesus into their heart. They had that born-again experience, and it was revealed in Christ's likeness. Mm. 
I don't know if we're, I feel like we're a little bit behind as I keep looking at the clock and I'm like, how much should I say? But I've got, I just had a conversation with somebody this week who has a different, they're not a Christian, I don't have a Christian worldview, but they, everybody has some type of utopian view. Like mm. at the end of all this, we're all going to love each other, get along. Get, and so it, it seems to me that what you're talking about is, okay, is, is it all about doctrine or what have you? Everybody has their doctrines. Mm -hmm. Where, what is the litmus test? Mm -hmm. Where does the rubber meet the road? What does it look like in a crisis? And this is what we're talking about in the persecution, whatever. You go back, you'll find that there have been a lot of theories for how to make a better world. Mm -hmm. the, the, the most successful, despite its shortcomings because of the backsliding of its people, the most successful has been the Christian faith. Astounding transformations of people and societies throughout, uh, and yes. time permitting, I mean, well, we and you think about, that. go back to our previous thought about how persecution didn't shake them. In fact, they yes. were like, bring it on. Let's do this. Now, if I have that kind of bulletproof mentality, when there's calamity all around, I'm not afraid of the disease. I'm not afraid of the of the, of the monetary, uh, well, financial, or the political, or the military. There's nothing that on this earth. What did Paul say? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Well, you mentioned, you speak of the disease, and the lesson brought that up. That there, it, yes. there was this pandemic in there. To, yes. Well, I know... Let's be frank. Us Seventh Day Adventists during the pandemic, we're scared to death because we might die. Mm. The Christian church is like, hey, there's a pandemic. I got to go and do everything I can for these people unless yeah. they die without Christ. Right. And many of them <laughs> succumbed to that that pandemic and lost their lives, but they rejoiced that they were able to get the gospel out. Come it's on just now. a vast and that that willingness to go. Remember that Christ method alone statement yes. we're always talking about. He mingled with them unless they were in danger. No, he mingled with lepers. He mingled with, you know, right. prostitutes and tax collectors and all the people that would be in trouble. He would go there, not because he wanted to be one of them or was endorsing their lifestyle, but he came close to them in personal ministry. Right. And, and, that's the, the, and the greater culture saw that. Yes. Like, that these guys aren't just talking something. They are putting their lives on the line to help us. And, and if, can you imagine what it would look like if the Christian church, the, let's pick the Seventh-day Adventist faith mm -hmm. specifically, with the present truth we have about the Sabbath, the Second Coming, the State of the Dead, the... the all the beautiful, powerful yes. truths were to also manifest that same proportion of genuine care and selfless service for yes. others. What it would look like if we not only had a public declaration, but we had a manifestation of that truth in life. Anyway, I get like excited Jesus. about it. It would look a lot like <laughs> Jesus. We can, you remember in Acts chapter 10 when he was in the household of Cornelius? What did Peter say to describe the ministry of Jesus? He was anointed by God and went about doing, doing good. good. And Jesus himself would talk about mm. how, if you don't believe me, believe the works. That's but can right. you at least see that there's an evidence believe here? Believe me for the works' sake. Right. Ellen White put it this way in Evangelism 5.14. The union of Christ-like work for the body and Christ-like work for the soul is the true interpretation of the gospel. Mm. There is no such thing as a theory of the gospel. It's either all gospel and Christ-like or it's not, right? Mm. And I put Absolutely. this little statement, it's just my own thought here, but I put it in the notes that ministry opportunities abound in a fallen world. Oh, when we look at the last days in which we're living and what Jesus described in Matthew 24, earthquakes, uh, disease, pestilence, you know, nation against nation, violence, violence and, and strife, ethnic, yes. whatever. Those are, yes, they are lamentable tragedies, but at the same time, they're incredible opportunities for person. They are hurting right. people all around. And we have an opportunity to minister to their whether it's their physical needs, their health needs, their financial needs, their psychological needs, whatever, we can be that light in their darkness. And in such, we can actually be Christians. We can be Christ-like yes. and then bear with that the truth of God's word. Mm. It cannot be without fruit. Right. And we're told that over again. So... Anyway, our time is literally running out. The timer's flashing at us right now, and I no, hate it, the thing. No, it is out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we're going to finish this off. One, there was a great kind of summary Wednesday. statement from Wednesday. Wednesday lesson, paragraph one. The early Christian church grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but also because they lived the gospel. It was this unselfish love and commitment to meeting human needs combined with sharing the good news of the gospel and the Holy Spirit's power that made such an impact on the world in the early centuries of the Christian church. And I would add, that surely is the case now that it will be the same in the last mm. centuries of this world's history, that Amen. God is looking for God-like people in this day and age. So let's be them and dedicate ourselves to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you never forsake your people, that you always provide a way out, 
and that if we are faithful to you, regardless of what persecution we might face, we can have victory in Jesus. And not only we ourselves can be saved, but we can be agents of God, ambassadors who can represent you in this world, give this gospel message in its full glory, and by God's grace, have others drawn to you. They may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. That is our prayer today, and let it be the, the dedication of our lives. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.